Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, to kick off clinical improvement rounds, uh, we have Rodrigo speaking with us today. <clears throat> uh, Rodrigo is from Brazil, graduated from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro Medical School in 2010, followed by two years in the Brazilian Army as a general practitioner. After his military period, he completed a residency program in anesthesiology. Next, he started to work in a major trauma center in Rio de Janeiro, uh, where he stayed on for four years. Uh, last year, he became staff anesthesiologist at the Antonio Pedro University Hospital, the teaching hospital from Fluency Federal University. The, his areas of interest from anesthesia uh, are obstetric anesthesia and regional anesthesia. Thank you again, Rodrigo, and I'll pass it on to you. you Good morning, everyone. Uh... Thank you for the presentation. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the Canadian Airway Focus Group, the updated consensus based the recommendations for the management of the difficult airway. I decided to present this article because one of the key recommendations is to back ventilate the obstetric patient, not only during a difficult airway scenario, but to back ventilate every single OB patient. Uh, this article is divided in two parts. The first part is the difficult airway management in an unconscious patient. And the second part is to planning a safe management plan in a, an anticipated difficult airway. In order for us to have a more anesthetic scenario, I mix it up a little bit, the information, and I'm going to present it both together. Uh, to begin with, I would like to talk about mobility related with the airway. Here in Canada, 70% of the anesthesia airway closed claims are related with patients for elective surgery. We take a look at this number in the other way. Only 22% of the closed claims related to airway was in an emergency situation. In all the other 78%, uh, the anesthesiologist had time to go with a plan to have an exit strategy, but unfortunately, something bad happened. In this article, they review it and they think the three most common uh, reasons for that bad situation. The first of all, it's the persistence with one technique. The second, fail to recognize a cannot ventilate, cannot oxygenate scenario. And the third one, it's fail with communicate with communication with no technical skills. So it's it's a failure to prepare for failure. When you don't have the scenario for the failure, if you don't have a plan for the airway management, we're gonna have a bad situation. So with a careful patient evaluation with the airway strategy, we can reduce the airway-related morbidity. So to begin with, we have uh, elective surgery, we have a patient, our first step should be the airway evaluation. We're gonna start with the anatomic predictors of difficulty, then we're gonna assess the physiologic issues of the patient, and then we're gonna analyze the clinical context. So the anatomic predictors of difficulty, it's our classical malampire score, the neck movement, if the patient can do the mandibular protrusion. Secondly, we have to, to take a look about pertinent diagnostic imaging studies, especially for patients that have a neck disease or a head disease. And third, the records of a previous airway management. And it's worth to mention that the records of a previous airway management have the highest predict value for a difficult airway. So this is our classic Malampari score. The class one, it's you, we can see the hard palate, the soft palate, the uvula and the pillars. The class two, we can see the hard palate, the soft palate and the beginning of the uvula. Class three, we can see the hard palate and the soft palate. And class four, we can see only the hard palate. Our first table is showing the predictors of the difficult face mask ventilation. If you take a close look, age over 46, BMI over 35, male, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, facial hair, 
uh, a lot of them, it's pretty common in our day-to-day -day routine. So easily on a day-to-day -day routine, we're gonna have patients with predictors of difficult face mask ventilation. Secondly, our predictors of superglottic airway insertion. Once again, very common for us to have this kind of predictors in our day to day. No T for prudentation, malum party three and malum party four, a limited head or neck mobility, uh, increased BMI, neck circumference over 44 centimeters, non supine patient position. And the third is the predictors of a difficult laryngoscopy. Once again, very common for us to find age above 46, male, malampari 3 and 4, limited cervical uh, extension, previous neck radiation if the patient had a history of head or neck uh, pathology, increased BMI, sleep apnea, very common for us to find this kind of patient. So our second step in the evaluation is the physiologic issues from the patient. The first, we have to analyze if the patient may have the apnea intolerance. Patients with a decreased functional residual capacity, our classic examples are the pediatric patient and the obstetric patients. Patients with an increased oxygen consumption, once again, the obstetric patient, it's a good example, but in the ICU, the sepsis patient, also it's a good example. Patients with a decreased PF ratio. In the pandemic scenario, the COVID patient, it's a good example of patients with a decreased PF ratio. And patients with acid-based disturbance with respiratory compensation, they also not gonna tolerate apnea. Uh, another situation that might impact the airway management, it's the full stomach or the major risk for aspiration. Guess what? Once again, the OB patient, it's a good example. And the third, it's the hemodynamic instability. The classical example is the trauma patient with a hypovolemic shock. For sure, it's gonna impact the airway management. And our third step is to evaluate the clinical context of the airway, the moment that the airway is going to be managed. So if you are in an adverse location, in a remote location, a difficult access to help, or if the airway manager have inexperience with a certain technique, lack of equipment, also you have to be aware of that. And the poor communication, as I told you in the first slide, the poor communication is the third reason for high morbidity with the airway during airway man management. So we, have, we do the, air, the airway evaluation. We have to think which patients with predictors of difficulty can safely manage after the induction of anesthesia. In 2011, uh, we had a UK study called the NAP4 and they studied four major uh, consequences after the airway management, the four major was death, brain damage, front of neck access, and admission in the ICU. 18 patients were cooperative with predictors of both face mask ventilation and tracheal intubation, and all of them suffered complication, and unfortunately, two have died. For that reason, the autos concluded that the awake tracheal intubation was underutilized. The awake tracheal intubation have clear benefits. First, the patient's gonna maintain their own airway patency and they're gonna keep the physiologic gas exchange. And also the patient gonna have his protection for the lower airway uh, against expiration. So at this time we reach our first fluxogram when the difficult tracheal intubation is predicted, we can go in two ways. The first way is try to avoid this airway. So the, our first question is, can the intubation be def deferred? Can the surgical case done with another type of anesthesia with a low risk of needing conversion to general anesthesia? Always have that in mind. 
with a low risk of needing conversion to general anesthesia. And once again, the classical example, you have the OB patient with a difficult tracheal intubation. If you can always do a spinal, but if you, in case you need it, something happened, in that case, it's safer for us to do a CS, uh, a combined epidural with spinal, have the epidural catheter just in case. But if you cannot do the, the case without general anesthesia, we have to proceed with four questions. Our first question is, is the awake tracheal intubation clearly indicated? The classical example is the patients with uh, significantly anatomic deformities, neck injury, head disease, and also not only pathologic, but a very limited mouth opening. It's also a clear indication for awake tracheal intubation. If no, we can proceed for our second question. The second question is, is difficulty also predicted with face mask ventilation and supraglottic airway ventilation? Because if you try to intubate the patient and you fail, you're gonna have to fall back to face mask ventilation and supraglottic airway ventilation. If, if both of them are difficult, you have to consider the awake intubation. If no, we can go to our third question. Are there adverse physiologic issues that might impact the decision? The patients with physiologic issues, <clears throat> these issues will be accentuated after the induction of the anesthesia. The awake intubation possibility us for divide this into two scenarios. The first scenario is the difficult airway management and the second scenario is the induction of the anesthesia. So if the patient have physiologic issues, we have to consider the awake intubation. And once again, if the answer is no, our last question, are there any complicating contextual issue that might impact the decision? If you are in a remote location that you don't have a glidoscope, for example, you, so yes, you have a contextual issue, you have to consider the awake intubation. If you answer no for all the four questions, you can consider the manage of the airway after the induction of the anesthesia. But if you answer yes to any of these questions, you have to do a last question. Can the patient cooperate with the awake intubation? And it's not or, it's and, and is there time? If yes, the patient can collaborate and you have time, it's not an emergency, consider the awake intubation. But if the patient cannot cooperate or if you don't have time, you have to proceed with the airway double setup. The airway double setup, it's have everything ready for your primary approach, your exit strategy, and also have everything ready for a front of neck access. Both of them have to be ready in the room. And here in the bottom of the slide, I think it's worth to mention the Difficult Airway Society from the UK, they have a guideline for awake intubation. It's a very recently guideline from 2020. It's worth to take a look. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about it. So we decided to manage the airway of the patient after the induction of the anesthesia. What should we do? First, the position, the classic sniff position to align the patient tragus with the sternal knot. Secondly, do a pre-oxygenate and the apneic oxygenation. The pre-oxygenate, it's 100% oxy oxygenation for three minutes of tidal volume breathing or the classic, take a deep breath, take a deep breath, eight vital capacity breathings or until we reach the fraction exhale oxygenation exceeds uh, 90%. Also, our third and fourth step have all the prepared equipment. Have your primary equipment ready and have your exit strategy clearly ready with a supraglottic airway always in the room. The fifth step is to brief the team, let people know. If you have an anticipated difficult airway, talk to the nurses, talk to the surgeons, let people know that this is a difficult airway scenario. 
The sixth step is to review and communicate your exit strategy. Let people know what your plan is, your plan A, plan B, plan C. Have every plan communicated. And the last step, if possible, if available, let a more experienced airway manager know that you are going to face an anticipated difficult airway. So we reach in the moment that we have this anticipated difficult airway, but we have to know when it's a difficult face mass ventilation, when it's a fail, when it's difficult superglottic, when it's a fail. So it's good to have in mind the definitions so we can have the scenarios. You can easily recognize the scenarios. So a difficult fail face mask, uh, difficult face mask ventilation, it's when the face mask ventilation is not is that inadequate despite optimized manners. We're gonna recognize the difficult face mask ventilation with a thin wet capnography trace, no plateau, and a decrease of chest rise. And a failed face mask ventilation, it's when we are unable to face mask ventilation the patient despite the optimizing manners. We're gonna recognize the fail with a flat capnography and no chest rise. And this table is showing what should we do when we face a difficult face mask ventilation. First, we have to ensure the depth of the anesthesia. Then we can use the oral pharyngeal airway, use the two-handed technique, two hands with exaggerated jaw lift and another person is gonna ventilate the patient, ensure the neuromuscular block, release if the cricoid pressure, if it's applied, considering the position, head up position of the patient. And if you fail to do it, go to another uh, ventilation mode, proceed to supraglottic airway or proceed to tracheal intubation. Secondly, a difficult and a failed supraglottic airway. A difficult supraglottic airway, it's more than one attempt. And a fail, it's when you have inadequate ventilation and oxygenation after three attempts of uh, supraglottic airway ventilation. And what should we do? Once again, ensure the depth of anesthesia, exaggerate the sniff position, and considering rotating the supraglottic airway 90 degrees. Personally, I really like this approach. I'm gonna try to show you. This is a supraglottic airway. I'm the patient, you go like that. When you reach the tongue, you advance rotating it. I think it's very, very good, a very good approach. Uh, consider the use of neuromuscular blockage if you didn't give the patient. And if you fail to progress, uh, change your mode of ventilation. Fall back to face mass ventilation or advance for a tracheal intubation. Now, when we have the difficult and failed laryngoscopy, our classic Cormacula hand grade, a difficult, it's the 2B and 3, a fail grade four, very quickly grade one, it's the view of the laryngeal inlet, grade two A, you only see the epiglottics and a partial view of the vocal cords. Two B, it's difficult and when you see the epiglottis and the arytenoids, room three, difficult, only see the epiglottis, room grade four, fail, we don't see the epiglottis. And what should you do? Once again, ensure that neuromuscular blockage, apply a external laryngeal manipulation, exaggerate the sniffing position, release the cricoid pressure. And I like at the bottom of the stable difficulty for a tracheal tube passage. The first recommendation, the use of a bougie. If you don't have a bougie, try to use the stylet to optimally shape the tracheal tube. And if you're having a suboptical glottic view, trying to progress for a video laryngoscope. And finally, when we have a difficult and failed tracheal intubation. Difficult tracheal intubation, it's more than one attempt or when we require a more experienced airway manager or when we change the technique. And a failed tracheal intubation happens when a patient is not intubated after three attempts. It's worth to mention that a failed tracheal intubation, it's not a pejorative name. 
you don't have to be ashamed of being in that scenario. When you have a failed intubation, you have to declare it and call for help. And the fear cannot ventilate, cannot oxygenate scenario. This scenario happens when you fail to ventilate the patient with all the free possibilities. Face mask ventilation, superglottic airway, and tracheal intubation. It's worth to mention that you, uh, in the past, the name was cannot intubate, can, cannot oxygenate. And they tried to change the name for cannot ventilate, cannot oxygenate. The reason for this change is try to take off the focus on tracheal intubation, especially in a difficult airway scenario. Sometimes people become uh, like a intubation zombie. Oh, intubation, intubation, intubation. They only think about intubation and they don't realize that ventilate, it's more important than intubate. And always keep in mind to avoid multiple tentative of tracheal intubation. Always ventilate, it's more important than intubate. Always fall back to a ventilate if you cannot track your intubate. So you have a patient, you have an anticipated difficult airway, and you have an unsuccessful first attempt. What should we do? In 2019, the ACA came with the preservation definition. The preservation is the consistent application of any airway management technique or two more than twice without deviation or change of technique or the return to a technique or two that have previously been unsuccessful. I used to have a staff in my residency that say that tracheal intubation, laryngoscopy, it's not like open the fridge. You know, when you're at home, nothing to do, you open the fridge and take a look, you don't know what you want and then you close the fridge. When you have a first attempt, an unsuccessful first attempt, you have to be sure what happened. You have to think about it, try to realize why you didn't get the track of intubation and your second attempt have to be optimized. So you have to open the fridge knowing what you know. I want a Coke, open the fridge, get the Coke, close the fridge. And always keep in mind, a maximum of three attempts. After three attempts, you have to think and consider an exit strategy. Now we reach our second fluxogram. The unsuccessful first attempt at tracheal intubation, what should we do next? Our first question must always be, is ventilation and oxygenation maintained by face mask ventilation or supraglottic airway? If yes, no more than two additional attempts. And remember, you don't open the fridge to take a look. This your second attempt, another optimized attempt, a different device or a different operator. And keep in mind that anytime you can go to an exit strategy. After two additional attempts, if you have an unsuccessful tracker intubation, declare fail intubation. Let people know this is a fail intubation scenario and ask, is ventilation and oxygenation is still non-problematic? If yes, you have to consider an exit strategy. Awaken the patient, the patient if possible. Place a supraglottic airway to temporize an additional tracker intubation attempt. And keep in mind that this is an additional tracker intubation attempt only if you have to change a different device that was not used or a different operator or lastly, the surgical airway. But after the first attempt of tracheal intubation, if the ventilation and oxygenation is not maintained by face mask ventilation or supraglottic airway, we have the cannot ventilate, cannot oxygenate scenario. At this moment, you have to call for help and then ensure the neuromuscular blockage and make a single attempt, if not try it, of face mask ventilation optimized by neuromuscular blockage, supraglottic airway, or the use of the video laryngoscope. If the single attempt is unsuccessful, immediately go for a front of neck airway access. And now we reach our special considerations. Our first special consideration, it's about the neuromuscular block. 
agent, which one to use, a short or an intermediate acting one. There is no evidence of benefit of using succinylcholine. Uh, the reason why it's the patient will not uh, reassume the spontaneous ventilation only because we use it succinylcholine. We're gonna have the residual effects of the other agents. And secondly, with the use of the intermediate acting neuromuscular block agent, we're gonna optimize the conditions for the duration of the airway management. So if you use the succinylcholine and you have the a fail first attempt, in your second attempt, the patient will not have a neuromuscular block and you have to use another muscular agent. So it's better for us to start it with the intermediated ones. That's the recommendation from the article. And now finally we reach the obstetric patient. The obstetric patient have a higher risk of an anticipated difficult airway, eight times greater chance of a failed tracker intubation. I'm gonna say it again because this is massive. Eight times greater risk of having a failed tracker intubation. Also, we have a challenge for landmark neck anatomy for the front of neck airway access, and we have a higher risk of aspiration. And with all in all, complications with the airway management, it's the leading cause of death, of maternal death, that's major. This table, I took it out from the chat's notebook. It's the anatomic and physiological factors that might raise the risk for airway complications during pregnancy. First, the airway edema, classical. The lady is gonna have a, a liquid retention during pregnancy, not only in the legs, but also in the airway, in the upper airway, a higher chance of airway trauma, higher chance of airway bleeding. Also a decreased functional residual capacity estimated in a decrease of 20% associated with an increase of oxygen consumption and also the higher risk of aspiration because of the decreased lower esophageal sphincter tone, especially association with the higher intra-abdominal pressure and a delay of gastric emptying labor, uh, especially with the progesterone. So with the obstetric patient, we have to always be prepared to a failed tracheal intubation. We have always to have in the room a spaglotic airway, glidoscope, a fiber optic bronchoscopy, and a cricotyrotomy equipment. And you, if you have for sure a patient with a difficult airway, we anesthesiologists have to fight for an early epidural. It's very important for us to try, as I said in the beginning, try to avoid the manipulation of this airway. When we have the general anesthesia in an OB patient, our first consideration is the position. Once again, the sniffy position, doing a second pillow, the true pillow, but align the patient tragus with the sternal knot. The pre-oxygenation is a face mask with a 15 liters per minute flow apneic uh, oxygenation with a high flow nasal oxygenation with a flow of five to 15. And after induction of anesthesia, face mask ventilation with positive inspiratory pressure lower than 20 centimeters of water. So we have to back ventilate every single patient. And if possible, primary use of the video laryngoscopy, primary use of the gliderscope. So the face mask ventilation, it's a balance between the higher risk of failed tracheal intubation and their higher risk of aspiration. With face mask ventilation, we're gonna erase the apnea time. So for the authors of the article, the benefits, it's more than the risk. That's why they recommend back ventilation every single OB patient. And how to respond uh, unsuccessful first attempt, rapidly move to face mask ventilation or supraglottic airway, call for help. If the ventilation is successful, a second attempt can be tried, but only with a different device or a more experienced airway manager. If the unsuccessful second attempt, we have to declare the failed tracker extubation 
and start to consider our exit strategies. A failed tracker intubation with a safe range of uh, oxygen uh, oximetry, the recommendation is the early use of supraglottic airway. If no fetal or maternal distress or not an emergency situation, the mother can be allowed to emerge, but let's be realistic. We're not gonna have this kind of situation. If we're doing a C-section on this GA, we're gonna have the fetal or the maternal distress, or it's going to be an emergent situation. And in that case, can we use the supraglottic airway for a C-section? The answer is yes, we can use a supraglottic airway for a C-section. In that case, we have to avoid the increase of the intra-abdominal pressure, ask the surgeon for a general surgical incision, and try not to do the fundal pressure for the delivery, ask the surgeon to use the vacuum extraction and always use the esophageal drainage port, put a suction catheter to protect the airway. And after the delivery, should we continue with the supraglottic airway or should we proceed to tracheal intubation? There is no evidence showing that we, sh that we have a benefit of taking out the supraglottic airway and trying a tracheal intubation. So after the delivery, we have to continue with a supraglottic airway. After the failed tracheal intubation, if you cannot rescue by face mask ventilation or supraglottic airway, we already have a cannot ventilate, cannot oxygenate scenario. In this scenario, we have to do a front of neck accents without delay. Our third special consideration, it's the morbidly obese patient. The morbidly obese patient with a BMI over 40 have four times likely to suffer an airway complication. The thick neck, uh, the neck circumference, circumference over 40 centimeters, it's very common. It's, and it's associated with a difficult landmark for front of neck airway access. The thick neck along with obstructive uh, sleep apnea is associated with face mask ventilation, supraglottic airway, and direct lar laryngoscopy difficulty. But the tricky thing is there are no studies associating video laryngoscopy with difficulty with the morbidity, morbidly obese patient. And always keep in mind that the obese patient have a reduction functional residual capacity, so apnea, it's poorly tolerated. So the recommendations for the obese patient, it's always considered the awake tracker intubation. Positioning, it's the key consideration. Always use the true pillow or the blanket or the a lot of pillows, but always try to align the tragos with the sternal knot. And our pre-oxygenation goal it's the fraction exhale oxy oxygen above 90%. And if possible, primary use of the video laryngoscope and always brief the team, communicate, say that this is a obese patient, we might have a difficult airway, prepare the team for a difficult airway scenario. And that's the image of the use of the ramp or the blankets or the true pillow. As I said before, try to align the tragos of the patient with the suprasternal note. And our last special consideration, it's the tracheal extubation. 25% of the airway related morbidity is associated during the tracheal extubation. During the tracheal extubation, we have to think about two scenarios. Can the patient tolerate the extubation? So can the patient maintain the gas exchange? Can the patient maintain the airway patency? And can the patient maintain the airway protection? Secondly, how difficult it will be for a reintubation? Have always a reintubation plan. And after a difficult airway with many multiple attempts of the, uh, laryngoscopy, sometimes you're gonna have the airway trauma. How to evaluate this? First, we can do the cuff leak test, exvasiate the cuff of the patient and see if you can hear the leak. 
If you cannot hear the leak, this patient probably have a airway edema. It's not safe to extubate this patient. Another possibility is to use the video laryngoscope and try to see the airway trauma, the airway edema, try to evaluate if it is possible to extubate this patient. And it's very important for us to keep in mind that the post-oxygenation, it's equally important as the pre-oxygenation. Always before extubation, keep the patient with 100% of oxygen for five minutes. And in a difficult airway scenario, it's always better to extubate with the patient awake than in a, uh, it's better to do it awake than in a deep anesthesia plan. And that's our, our table for a safe tracheal extubation. The first is the reversal. Always be sure the recovery of the neuromuscular blocked. The extubation plan, always have an extubation plan. Access the risk of extubation. Do the leak test. Try to use the video laryngoscope to analyze the, the, the airway, to analyze if you have an airway edema or trauma. Verify that we have the equipment, the personal, and the environment factors optimize it. Brief the team about the extubation. During the extubation, consider the sterile cockpit. I really like this idea, the sterile cockpit. The idea is during the intubation, everybody's concentrated, uh, everybody know the nurses, the surgeon, you, but during extubation, sometimes the nurses, it's already moving the material away from the room. The surgeons are talking about the surgery, the next patient, or about the football match, anything. Everybody is thinking about other things and people don't valorize the extubation moment. So try to do a stereo cockpit, ask people to leave the room, ask for silence, be ready and prepare for extubation. Recovery and safe, it's planned for the location, for monitors, for observation. Do a safe transfer and randover. Let people from the recovery area to know that this patient was a difficult airway and you plan to extubate because you evaluate it was safe, you think, but let people know that this patient might be difficult for reintubation. And always have the failure plan. Always have the extubation criteria and equipment and personnel in case that a reintubation is necessary. And to conclude our key considerations, the airway evaluation should always occur. If none is being predicted, the anticipated difficult airway can always occur. So always be ready, always be ready. Remember the concept failure to prepare for failure. So always be prepared for failure. Consider the awake tracker intubation because the awake tracker intubation is gonna give you an extra margin of safety. And always remember that an awake tracker intubation can be done by oral, nasal, or front of neck. And another cons uh, good consideration, if you fail for an awake tracker intubation, we can always do a front of neck airway access awake. If the patient it's not cooperate, or if you don't have time, do the double setup. The double setup, remembering the first setup is the airway management, and the second setup is the front of neck airway. Have everything in the room, the equipment. The, the lack of experience with any technique, it's not a reason for not choosing it. So if you judge that you have a lack of experience in any technique, call for help. It's not a reason for not choosing it. And remember, the failed tracheal intubation, it's not a pejorative name. If you have a failed tracheal intubation scenario, let people know, declare the failed tracheal intubation. Remember, the third cause of complications during airway management, it's no technical skills. It's not talking with the team. So talk, brief the team, talk to the nurses, talk to the surgeons, let people know that you might gonna face a difficult airway management and have extra care with patients with head and neck pathologies, classical indications for awake tracheal intubation, obesity patients, positioning is the key recommendation, 
remember the use of the true pillow, the blanket, and always aim to have the tragos aligned with the sternal node. And the obstetric patients, higher chance of having failed tracheal intubation. Don't be afraid of face mask ventilating the obstetric patient. And finally, the tracheal intubation. You have to be carefully planned. You have to plan the tracheal intubation and we have to plan the tracheal intubation. We always have that in mind. Can the patient tolerate? Always think, can the patient maintain the gas exchange? Can the patient have the airway patency? And can the patient have the airway protection? And always have a reintubation plan. Thank you everyone for your time. This was my considerations in this article. If you have any questions or any considerations, I'm glad to share with you my thoughts. Very good comment. I thought that was an excellent presentation. I wanted to thank you. Um, this Chris speaking. Um, I think the last, uh, and it was of keen interest to, to me because we had a recent event and the uh, most important thing was they identified the event early and they brought help early to bear. And the, there was a positive patient outcome on a candidate debate can't ventilate. My worry is when you're working at, the, at night at the Jervinsky run obstetrics and you have a difficult airway, that there's not enough, um, there's not a lot of help to call to help you. So I just wanted people to be aware of that. And if you suspected to call for help early because help may be very many minutes away. And uh, um, it's always been a worry of mine. And we were really lucky in the operating room uh, that it happened in the, in the morning when there was all kinds of help to come in and help. And uh, they recognized there was a problem, they called for help and then they brought the um, they, they brought what they needed to the, to the table. It, it, as all of us, we should practice it more because it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a, I think, it, I think the airway management can always be smoother and there's always room for practice on our part. But uh, I'm very worried about when you're isolated or on call and alone. And I think identification of a problem before it happens, um, if possible, is key. That's all I wanted to, to add and that we should maybe do some practice drills on this. And any comments that appreciate. Yeah, just to build on that, I don't think people should hesitate to, if um, if the case warrants it, to delay a case that, you know, the surgeon wants to do at nine o'clock at night at Jervinsky. If you think that you're going to have challenges with the airway, to delay it to daytime hours or weekday hours, um, when you know you're going to have the help and support. But not only that, or you can delay it till you call in for either, either a surgeon that can is good with airway management and anesthesiologist who wants to be there, because some cases can't wait. But waiting half an hour for help when you think you have a problem is ideal, um, rather than putting yourself in harm's way. Because the first thing they'll ask you is, could you have waited half an hour? Could you call for help? So I think Anne-Marie's point is really, um, really important. There's some cases that have to go that night but it means you have to bring the resources you need to the table and not rely on uh, good fortune. Rodrigo, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Dr. Park. Yes, um, Rodrigo, it was excellent presentation. I just have a, I missed the first part, so I may, I just want to go back to the concept of CVCO, cannot ventilate, cannot sure. oxygenate. This is a little bit new to me because we are, most of us are familiar with the CICV and CICO. Um, sure. Is that gonna... the reason why, I'm just, is it because you, you want to de-emphasize intubation? Because to me, CVCO is eventually, and it's a different concept, but eventually, uh, point yeah. thing. Yeah, the, the reason that the article chose to change the name is try to not emphasize uh, the intubation during a difficult airway scenario. It's more important to ventilate the patient than to intubate the patient. Okay. So if you cannot intubate the patient, always have in mind that you can fall back for a face mask ventilation or for a superglottic airway ventilation. Always have in mind that you have to ventilate the patient before 
trying again the tracker intubation or before change the device before change always keep in mind that ventilating it's more important than intubation okay thank you um the other question i would have is that are there more tools out there that could help us like there's a new um glide scope blade that actually holds a bronc blade in position and uh um, perhaps we could have Rodrigo or Fadi or someone look at the at the um, equipment that's out there and see if there's any more equipment that might make our job easier in a difficult situation. Um, just the thought, but it's it's always good to think about once a year. Sure. Uh, to be honest with you, Doctor Rich, I never heard about this glidoscope blade, but I'm gonna search and talk to you for sure. Uh, Bruno here. Rodrigo, good job with the presentation. Thank you very much for updating us on this very important topic of, of airway, in, especially in OB patients. Um, I just, um, just want to um, emphasize the, the use and the resource that we have of simulation. Uh, I think Joe Hemister, I don't know if he's on the call, but Joe can maybe provide some sessions for us because, you know, having the experience of uh, researching uh, staff uh, in a scenario cannot intubate, cannot ventilate. Um, you know, when I was doing my fellowship at uh, St. Mike's, we did this study and we recruited all the staff to do a scenario cannot intubate, cannot ventilate. And the first time is, is horrible. Nobody gets it right sort of thing. And in the second one, it's fantastic. And, and that lasts for at least a year. And uh, it's really hard to learn by just reading things. We actually have to put our hands on and experience, you know, uh, stuff go going down, right? So I, uh, I just urge us to, to have uh, such thing. I want to definitely get Rodrigo in a simulator. I'm gonna to talk to Joe about that, but I also urge all of us to, uh, to go into simulation at some point and practice these things. Just to add to that, Bruno, we have um, done in situ simulation on LND with can't intubate, can't ventilate, just to run through that, just because, especially up there when it happens, you're very isolated and also um, help is very far away. Um, and then you have to have the consideration of, you know, a fetal D cell in the baby. So I think this is something that uh, maybe we can do other places as well, but also kind of bring back and keep repeatedly doing. Um, can I add something here? It's Linda. To let everybody know that the effort and emergency manual, the new one is out, um, which includes the updates for 2020 um, ACLS, but also different categories as well um, for one of them is difficult intubation. And so you can have a look at that. But more importantly, I want to um, put this into people's mind. The emergency manual is actually used in many different ways. One of the ways, and people have alluded to this in the talk, um, is to use it for preparation. So um, it's a good tool, a helpful tool to look at that and help plan your strategy with actually your team. So that would include having the nurses look at it so that they understand at which part of the algorithm you're on each time you move. And um, in different occasions for preparation for things for um, like if I had somebody with it recently with supraventricular tachycardia, I used it to help the nurses guide them through each step that I'll be taking and where what their response should be. So it's a, it's a tool to help with communication and preparation, not necessarily during the time of your um, difficulty. Um, it can be used, but um, you probably have need a lot more hands and need a lot more things. So I wanna emphasize that it's a preparation tool, a just-in-time preparation tool. And this is what I'm trying to get across to the residents as well. The last thing it can be also used for is debriefing. So when you have a situation and you get through it, um, look at it with your team as a structure framework for debriefing for the part that involves anesthesia um, 
and see if you were able to achieve what is the recommendations for the difficult airway. It's, it's, and that's how you can come to a idea of what parts that we could have done better, or what parts we really, really did well on. Um, so I want to emphasize the preparation and the, de and the debriefing use of the cognitive aids. Now I'm trying to get the, cogn the new cognitive aids up in the different sections. Um, and I need the support of the department to do that um, because there is cost to them. Um, so it's not a, a huge cost, it's just minimal. But not only do I need the support for cost, but I need the support because in order to make the cognitive aids relevant, they have to be tailored to what we're doing. So what I mean is that uh, we have different um, massive transfusion criteria, perhaps, 